today I want to get back kind of from a more components perspective to looking at the larger system. So I want to talk about mistakes that an AI component does, what the consequences for a system are, how we can think about this, and how we think about um, risk, how we plan for mistakes, uh, how we think about requirements probably at, at some larger scale if we get there. So um, let me see. I think when we're dealing, and you had this in your reading as well, when we're dealing with um, machine learning components, we essentially always have to expect some sort of wrong predictions. Right? There are lots of examples. So the cancer detection system that we talked about might just be wrong, right? It may not detect the cancer. It may detect that there's cancer, which leads to an invasive kind of operation that may, may not have been necessary. And we can think about what are the consequences of this, right? So in some cases, uh, models are wrong and they lead um, to uh, some inconvenience, right? So maybe you need to do some extra tests, but they could be life-threatening, kind of safety relevant in some cases. Um, there are a bunch of other consequences, right? So this was as well known, kind of the Uber self-driving car in an accident. Um, again, very clear safety implication, um, right? Also probably quite a problem for the reputation of Uber and self-driving cars more broadly, right? So they stopped all the testing that probably severely limited their operation and development facilities. There are tons of examples of um, Amazon Alexa gone bad. Um, not all of them, like the first one is more, almost more of a funny story where a neighbor complained about kind of really loud music. And this was somebody leaving the home for the weekend and Alexa just by some coincidence started to have a party at really loud volume. So it picked up on something um, and started music loudly, right? So that led to neighbors coming in and uh, or calling the police. Um, there are lots of stories about uh, Alexa devices buying all kinds of things because something was playing on the um, uh, on TV, um, right? So that it picked up on. Um, I should have put the XKCD comic about ordering a million jelly beans um, whenever entering a house in here. Um, so there are lots of examples. The, the dollhouse thing is probably not technically true. Um, but it's a funny story anyway, and very believable, right? So in this case, probably not, the first case you could argue this is safety again, right? This is uh, environment pollution and so on. Uh, the second case, probably not a safety issue, but you can still think about what are the consequences here, right? For the family where the horse is, uh, the, the doll house is bought, um, financial, also maybe for Amazon, reputation of Amazon, things like this. Uh, you remember this? Kind of, um, Microsoft had this chatbot that could interact and learn from chatting with other people on Twitter. That uh, turned racist pretty quickly and um, they shut it down after a day. Right, so again, what are the consequences here? Right, so it's probably more a reputation thing, probably not a huge financial loss, probably a research project that hasn't worked out as they wanted it, uh, they learned something from it, um, probably some hurt feelings, maybe. And then, again, I could go on forever, right? So there are lots of examples of machine learning things, it's not working as intended, making mistakes, um, Amazon tried for many years to use machine learning to, for recruitment, for scanning applications, and they found this was terribly biased, right? It was picking up on the school that people graduated from, and it were, if it was a majority uh, female school or something like this, this was, was kind of harmful, right? E even if you uh, hit what the gender of the person was. Um, do you have any examples of kind of machine learning systems that you may have interacted with that made mistakes, can be really low stakes or high stakes, uh, things that you have seen um, personally experienced. 
can either write or just raise your hand and speak out. Google faces not recognizing certain faces and especially then people of color, yeah. Um, not sure how important this is for your image collection. This is certainly not great for the reputation of the service provider. Nathan? I get this is not a machine learning system, but even just some of the everyday things that we use, like automatic, you know, hand washers, like you go, you put your hands under the sensor and sometimes those don't work for mm -hmm. uh, uh, people who have darker skin tones. So mm -hmm. even systems that don't have an ML component could have some sort of bias. Yep. I had this on an earlier slide that I skipped and wanted to come back later, but yeah. Um, there are lots of these things where there's a question of how these were tested. Um, uh, text correcting engines taking into account different dialects, not even English. Um, any specific experience? Uh, Google Home works poorly for certain dialects. I mean, it works poorly in general, right? So it may, like, uh, well, I should probably not say this. If, if you're saying certain dialects, it doesn't detect my dialects very well when I want to put certain specific things on the shopping list. I suspect this is also a case with people who have English as a native language, but it could just be my dialect if you want to blame it this way. Um, right, so it certainly makes mistakes all the time uh, for recognizing to-dos, for recognizing things on the shopping list. Um, the consequences are, again, there's a range of things, right? It may, may not schedule my meeting or it may put the wrong thing on the shopping list. Sometimes it's just funny, sometimes it's annoying. It's usually something that I can undo that's not life critical, but um, yeah. Any other examples you can think of? Navigation systems, there are probably lots of funny stories. Chris? Yeah, I think um, sometimes with recommendation systems, um, I think people have seen this with YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, someone actually mentioned it. Um, it'll recommend like the same, uh, I guess, or videos with similar content and just keep recommending those without ever recommending you movie uh, videos that are different, I guess. Sort of like a rabbit hole. Yeah, if you keep watching them. <laughs> right, and it just reinforces itself, basically. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, they actually broke this recently. It's another thing that I want to talk about later. They broke this manually um, with conspiracy theory videos. There were people watching conspiracy videos and then getting recommended more of them and watching more and so on. And it's actually, the algorithm is working as designed. Um, people watch this, so they want to watch more, kind of. Um, but they hard coded specific rules to break this, um, to actually overwrite the machine learning system there. Right. So lots of examples, and I think we can probably go for on forever. Um, I think it's useful to think a little bit about where those problems come from. Um, and there are many different sources of issues, and it's not usually easy to say, again, we don't have specifications, right? So the model picks, um, picks up on something, uh, maybe not what we're intending. Um, so, what are some, some things that you can think about that's causing wrong predictions? So some of the examples that we talked about, um, uh, poor recommendations, uh, system not recognizing when I want to add something to my shopping list, Google photos not recognizing faces of people of color, um, the Uber crash, um, whatever, right? So. Um, Training data was biased. That's a very common thing, right? So you just don't have training data that's close to it. Um, you're trying to predict something that's out of distribution. Uh, what else could happen? The input into the system might be wrong, right? So sensor measurement errors. So you have unreliable inputs. Um, you have feedback loops. Um, so this is, this typically has to do with data drift, right? So you learn a model at one point in time uh, and may have been accurate then, but the world has changed and the model hasn't changed with it. There are many more examples. Um, the typical thing is machine learning tends to look for correlations, right? It looks for things that 
occur together, it doesn't mean that they belong together, right? Spurious correlations are common. So these are, there's a tumbler of spur spurious correlations. There are tons of these. These are just some interesting ones, like uh, the number of people who drowned in swimming pools is strongly correlated with how many movies Nicolas Cage uh, released in one year for a while. There's probably no causal link here. A machine learning system might pick up on this, right? Might pick up that there's lots of Nicolas Cage movies in a year. Maybe we should protect our swimming pools or something, right? Um, this is something that it just, it doesn't understand it better, right? Um, or the divorce rate in uh, Maine uh, versus a reduction or the consumption in, of margarine. So the system might recommend to reduce, kind of maybe produce a public advertisement campaign to eat more butter instead of margarine um, to kind of protect our marriage in Maine, right? Um, there's also a big issue here with, um, even if we see correlations, um, and there is something behind this, it might not be what we're expecting. The classic example here is that coffee is, str is fairly strongly correlated with cancer, right? Coffee drinkers are more likely to get cancer than non-coffee drinkers. But again, this isn't, this is a correlation. There's no causation between this. Cancer, as far as we know, does not, uh, coffee does not cause cancer, right? The thing that's actually the cause here is smoking and smoking is fairly strongly correlated with coffee consumption, right? Smokers drink more coffee on average. Um, so there is actually some causes here, but the model may not pick up on the right causes, right? It's not reason, reasoning causally, it's reasoning about correlations. So you might get recommendations because of something, uh, because you have watched something, because you bought something, and there's some correlation with other people who bought this, but there might be some effects that the model simply doesn't know. There are actually lots of interesting examples of this. Um, one example that I recently um, heard about was um, cancer prediction actually works amazingly well in some contexts um, because it picks up on certain texts in the image, not because of the cancer that's actually in the scan or not. What it picks up on is that there are certain devices used to scan for cancer, and it picks up that there are mobile devices and stationary devices. Mobile devices are ten, tend to be used on patients who are too sick to make it to the stationary devices, so they have a much lower survival chance. So the model actually picks up on kind of labels that it's not supposed to learn. It kind of cheats, right? It kind of learns from something that's a hidden confound um, it actually picks up on, on some information here, but it's actually the human making the call or some inputs that, that are not supposed to be used. There's also lots of interesting examples of reverse causality, um, that there might actually be some causation, but it's the other way around. A classic old example is playing chess, kind of early chess computers trained with chess master moves learned that sacrificing your queen is actually a very smart move because in a lot of chess master games, if somebody sacrifices their queen, that's, they only do this if they're about to win, right? So if you look at chess master game, they're not sacrificing their queen in kind of stupid situations. Um, but the model, early machine learning models in the 80s picked up on sacrificing your queen is a good idea, right? Whereas the causality is the other way around. Because they're about to win, um, this is a move um, that only works there. Another interesting example is um, a system that only looks at hotel reservations might figure out that the prices are very high if there's a lot of demand. If you don't know the error of the causation, you must just suggest, raise your prices, demand will rise, right? So um, again, the system, just doesn't know the causation, it sees correlation and may have problems understanding what's happening. And another very common problem is that systems 
only see data about things what happened in many cases, but not about things that haven't happened. Right? So if you're learning, for example, stock prices, um, you only have one reality, right? You see what happened in the past and you can kind of think about there was maybe some press release and then the stock price rose and maybe that was correlated or that was causing it, but we don't know what would have happened without the press release. Another example is you are taking this course. Is this causing you to be better in your job later doing machine learning or applying machine learning? Maybe, but maybe you would have ended up in that job anyway because you're already interested in those topics, right? So that there's a reason behind why you're taking the course and you don't know what would have happened otherwise. Right? There are some cases where you can simulate this, where you know what the character factual might be. Right, so the kind of what if question, what if I hadn't done this? But in most cases, we don't know this. And then all the obvious reasons um, about many of that you mentioned, right? Insufficient training data, noisy training data, bias in the training data, a model that just poorly fits the data that overfits or underfits, right? Um, where you select the wrong model, maybe you have nonlinear effects, but you model it with a linear model. Um, you just don't have the context to identify the right prediction. Um, right? So you're trying to predict the stock market from Twitter data, but Twitter data is insufficient to really, I don't know what would be sufficient to predict the stock market. Um, your inputs are noisy or, you, or you're trying to predict something that's far away from your training data, right? So this out of distribution inputs where you're learning on some data, but then you're predicting something else. Well, there's one more, I think, quite useful thing, way to think about this. And Jake brought this up um, a week ago or so, um, Black Swan events. So you can think about that machine learning is suitable for some kind of scenarios more than for others. I find this terminology of known knowns, known unknowns, and so on, always very confusing. Um, but if you don't want to follow this, just look at the categories. So there are some cases where we can make predictions and we're fairly confident about predictions. Right? So we have rich data available, models can make good predictions near the training data. Um, what kind of, well, let me show the other ones and then we talk about what they might be. Then there are cases where we know that we won't be great at predicting things because we're trying to predict something for which we have almost no data. Uh, we're trying to um, predict really rare events. Um, those would be kind of known risks, right? So the model can detect that it just doesn't really, it's low confidence in this. It doesn't, doesn't have a lot of support. And then there are things that are really hard to anticipate because we simply can't foresee them, right? So there's essentially no way of modeling this either for humans or for machines. And the last one here is called unknown knowns um, is where the model thinks it knows what it does, but it's completely wrong, right? So the model says with really high confidence, there's cancer in the image, but there is none, right? Or any of those situations. So maybe a different way, I really have a hard time putting this into, into these boxes, but it's kind of roughly on one side, how good are our predictions? Do we know what we're predicting or not? No, do we know how good our predictions are? Like we, we kind of know that we know or we know that we don't know. Um, and then how confident are we in our prediction? High confident, low confident. Can you give me couple of examples for each of these things. So what are some examples of known knowns? So things where we have good training data, machine learning works usually fairly well with high confidence. Uh, we have lots of data, we can do good predictions. Email spam detection, right? We have tons of data, sentiment analysis, right? Actually, most of the common machine learning tasks that are kind of mainstream, right? Translation, language recognition, navigation, recommendation engines, um, right? Kind of 
expecting how a car will behave, face detection, right? So a lot of these things where we have a lot of images uh, or a lot of training data, uh, and we usually do fairly well. What are the things where we know that we're doing badly? What are some examples that machines are pretty bad at, but we can recognize it? Quantum physics, maybe. So examples of prediction problems where we just don't have a lot of data to go for. Try to predict elections. This is something where you have kind of data every four years, right? So this is something where you have very sparse data. Um, um, another example is kind of mergers of two companies trying to predict whether it's a good idea or, or not, right? So there is some data, but you don't have a lot of things to compare this with, right? You don't have a lot of public information about other companies. Typically, Humans also don't have a lot of data, but they usually are better at connecting dots, at thinking about this, making judgment calls. Um, so humans often are better at these kind of tasks, um, predicting elections with some data maybe, or predicting whether a merger is a good idea, maybe telling jokes, um, maybe quantum physics, I'm not sure. Um, what are some examples of black swan events? things that neither humans nor machines can't predict. The 9-11 attack, yeah. And kind of all the consequences, a pandemic, right? Actually lots of consequences of a pandemic. Um, like a lot of these things change a lot, right? So the, uh, a lot of kind of inventory prediction algorithms suddenly don't work anymore. People start hoarding toilet paper, right? So this is something that you can't foresee really, or very unlikely that you can foresee it, right? And humans and machines are similarly bad at this, cr uh, stock crashes as well, right? Um, and then there are lots of examples including the ones that I've shown you earlier, where a machine might be super confident that it's right, but it's wrong, right? So it's again, often examples uh, where we have a lot of data, but it's still wrong. Um, I don't think that there's a real category of things, um, of examples where this happens. It's pretty much all prediction kind of things. The chess example that I gave you is one of them, right? So where a machine might be very confident in all cases where I've seen somebody has sacrificed their queen and then they won, right? So it makes a prediction, sacrifice your queen and it's completely wrong, but it's super confident in its decision, right? Um, humans are way less common uh, prone to make those mistakes. This is something that's much more kind of in a machine realm. So in a sense, I think the main message here is just accept that machines will make mistakes. Right? So never expect a machine learning component to be right. If you have symbolic AI and you can model this, right, you can get guarantees, right? And you can do a lot of investments in making better models, but you still need to anticipate that there might be mistakes. And the thing that was in the reading also in, in Hilton's book is that the mistakes that machines make are not the kind of I'm, I'm a near miss mistakes, right? They might make very crazy, unpredictable mistakes. Um, like in the, in the picture below, it's completely unclear why it recognizes one as a panda and one as a given. And it's very certain about the, the given, right? Um, humans tend to make mistakes as well, but they are more predictable. They, make, they follow certain kind of patterns of mistakes. Um, so machine learning models might be really wildly wrong when they are wrong uh, because of a bunch of reasons that we talked about and because we simply don't understand what's happening. Right? Um, and they might be confident about the answer. So just looking at their confidence scores 
like we had this with the decision trees, right? In a decision tree, we know the, the answer is true or false. We should go golfing or not. And we know the kind of a confidence score by in 90% of the observ observed data, we went golfing in the, these kind of conditions, right? Um, the confidence alone doesn't really help you, um, right? You might be very confident and wrong. So I think in designing a system, it's always a good idea to just accept mistakes might happen. Assume AI components or machine learning components to be unreliable components. They might be good 90% of the case, 99% of the case, but always assume they might make random, unpredicted, mis unpredictable mistakes. Um, they might be confident about their mistakes. Um, so whenever you design something, design the system to be secure or safe, even if the machine learning component makes a mistake. And this is why we need to zoom out, right? So the component itself is unreliable and we can probably not fix that. So we need to think about how to think about the entire system to deal with kind of unreliability. And there are a couple of different strategies. Um, there are a few parts of how you can make the component itself reliable. So if you don't use kind of machine learning, but you actually use symbolic reasoning, you might get guarantees. Uh, if you have interpreter models and you have a human verify the model, I'll show you an example later, um, you might get much more higher confidence, right? If you actually understand what's happening, or you might do things where you predict things to really near training data that you're very certain that you're not predicting out of distribution, anything that's really different. Um, so there might be a few strategies where you get really high confidence, but in general, just anticipate there might be mistakes, you need to deal with them. And again, we need to deal with this at the system level. We talked about um, this case before where we talked about kind of designing the UI, designing the experience, right? How forceful is it? How frequent do we interact with this? How do we keep a human involved? Should we keep a human involved? Should we take automated actions, right? This is one way to think about this. Another way to think about this, we talked about before is kind of system level safeguards, right? We could talk about a thermal, few, a thermal fuse for a smart toaster that would just um, burn out in the worst case rather than burning down the toaster and then my kitchen. So there are a couple of common strategies that you can think about here. Um, I'm not sure that this is a comprehensive list. There were some in the reading as well. Um, one of the common things is to think about guardrails. <clears throat> is there something, if you know what the worst thing kind of can be, can you stop something? If you know the machine learning component may make mistakes, how can you protect against this? Right? The example here was a toaster where even if it makes a stupid prediction, if it overheats, we just shut it off. And I think there are lots of settings where you can think about, is there kind of something to prevent damage in the end? But also not in every system, right? So I have a hard time thinking about effective guardrails for um, cancer detection in an image, right? So you can protect against very uh, other, actually, um, there you probably have some human in a loop uh, in kind of some system level, not, not in the software system, right, but kind of in the process level, um, some guardrails to protect against this, like having an independent assessment, maybe with a different scan or different thing. Another strategy that's also common in kind of uh, fault tolerant systems traditionally is redundancy and some sort of voting. Right? We talked briefly about in some other lecture, about the ten tendency in some really critical system just to implement the system twice and hope that people don't make the um, same mistake in both implementation. Um, this is very common in machine learning in the sense of ensemble learning, where you just train many different models and you kind of average over them. Um, random forests are a very classic basic way of ensemble learning where you just train multiple different decision trees and average over them and that seems to work pretty well in general, you still may make mistakes, right? Um, it reduces overfitting, but you don't protect against other issues like reverse causality. Um, especially if the data is biased, this doesn't help at all really, right? Because you're learning from biased data, so all the models are learning from the same biased data. 
Um, it's also common that you use some hard-coded rules or heuristics. Like in the toaster example, you could hard-code something, never toast for longer than 10 minutes in a row. Right? So this is something that you can hard-code. Um, you do this often for important inputs. You might overwrite mistakes. Um, a couple of examples like this. And then I think a large class is where you just involve a human in some sense. Right? So there are many different things, and a lot of this has to do with designing the experience, designing the user interaction, the user interface, what we already talked about a little bit before. Right? Um, for example, instead of taking an action automatically, you can involve the user, you can make suggestions, you can ask for confirmations. And also humans and machines are good at predicting different kind of things. Right? They have different kind of problems that we're doing. So maybe let them work together. Um, but there are also problems with this, right? So this is, it's not my area of expertise and I don't want to go too deep into this. There's also a course that we have on human machine AI design at Carnegie Mellon. Um, but think about, so classic problems are, if you just bug the user all the time, they kind of get complacent or um, for notification fatigue is a common example. Do you have an example of a machine learning system that kind of wants to keep you in the loop, but you start ignoring it or you just say yes, 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 or something like this? I think I think it's got an AI component, but my phone keeps telling me the weather, not through like a weather app or anything like that, and it randomly tells me the weather, and I really don't care. Okay, I'm not sure whether it wants you to take an action or this is more notification. Yeah, yeah. but it's an it's an annoying interaction design certainly. Um, there are a bunch of cars that ask you to confirm every time you start the car that you're driving safely. Kind of, uh, kind of with the when it shows a navigation thing or something like this, right? Don't be distracted. Don't use your phone while driving. Um, the army has a discussion. Um, well, so so Jake brings up uh, AI in, involved in medical devices, right? So um, if you bring up too many false alarms and you kind of wait for a nurse to catch this, right? That they don't intervene. Um, they might just completely ignore the alarms at some point. Um, in the cancer example, you might think of something else, right? So if the model is constantly wrong, a physician might just ignore it at some point. Um, if the model is always true in their experience, they might also not really think about it and don't critically question the um, example of the model. The recidivism example is another good example. The idea um, of the, do I have this here? I think, right, so, so, so this kind of compact compass model and things like this that kind of predict whether somebody will commit another crime. This is essentially just supposed to do a simple prediction whether somebody will commit another crime. That should be an input into a judge's decision about whether they release somebody on bail or not. And the model doesn't really care about the severity of the past crimes and things like this. So the judge should make a judgment call here about whether to release something. The problem is that it's very easy to get complacent, right? So kind of just say, I get this magic number from the tool and it tells me, oh, he's likely to commit a crime. So I'm going to reject bail. There's actually a lot of cases where I think people found that judges don't really understand what the tool really does, how limited it is, and they don't really make uh, good informed decisions. They just kind of do checkbox compliance, right? Or you have somebody in the loop. There's also a lot of discussion in the, um, in the, in the military. Um, I don't know the, the current status, but there, there was an order a couple of years ago um, that's interpreted to say that um, whatever happens, there always needs to be a human in the loop because it, before there's a decision to engage in an 
killing somebody. Right? So even though we have drones that could easily automatically detect and take somebody out, there needs to be a human in the loop. But again, uh, you can think about if the machine tells you with some confidence something, how critical is a human going to be? Um, is this really just a checkpoint that we can say if Congress starts an investigation because we start civilians, um, that there was a human in the loop and it was human error? Right, rather than machine error, um, maybe the, the system was designed. It's always easy to blame humans, right? Um, but it's also hard to kind of have humans in the loop as a checkpoint. The example that I have in the slide here is the Tesla autopilot. Um, Tesla has a self-driving feature, right, that works pretty well uh, as far as I hear. Um, you kind of can take your hands off and do other things. Uh, it might be by you, or maybe you need the hands on the wheel but can read or something. Uh, you're not supposed to do this. And there's really confusing kind of uh, communication around this. In the advertisement, Tesla essentially advertises this or has advertised this as a self-driving feature, right? So they essentially say it's self-driving, but then in their liability thing, they'd say, you always need to be have your hands on the wheel. You always need to pay attention. If the self-driving car crashes, it's your fault because you're in charge, right? And there's kind of this disconnect between, um, we put humans sometimes in the loop to oversee this, but if we don't design this correctly, they might be fatigued, they might not actually pay attention, they might become complacent, right? Just follow the predictions or just ignore the predictions. Um, and there's quite a question here, to, to what degree do we put humans in the loop only for kind of liability reasons um, right? um, that we can blame a human if something goes wrong? Yeah, in the PowerPoint example, for, uh, we have a human in the loop, right? And it's very obvious that we have a human in the loop because we only sh recommend certain things and a human needs to actively even pick the feature, pick an option and do something, right? So there's um, very clearly a human in the loop. Another thing of mitigating mistakes is to provide an option to undo mistakes. This doesn't work in every case, right? So if you have a military drone that kills somebody, it's hard to undo. Um, if you make a design choice in PowerPoint, it's easier to undo. Um, give any other examples of AI techniques that take actions for you that you can undo? Or that the human can overwrite? So there's a default action, but it can be overwritten by somebody. Email spam, yes, you can undo this, right? You can overwrite this or flagging emails as important. Typing ahead, yeah, um, there's predictions. You can accept them. You can also just delete the text again, right? Um, credit card applications tend to be one of them, right? So where you get a default decision and then you can appeal maybe to the manager, although these days, the managers don't have a lot of leeway often or don't want to, right? So they just accept the machine prediction, um, right? A bunch of smart home things that may, may take automated action, but you can overrule it, right? If your thermostat thinks it's, it goes way warmer than you want it, you can overrule it. Um, and you, it's not entirely undoable, right? That you're a bit too warm for a bit, but it's not a long-term consequence. And then I think this is a special kind of direction, but if you have really interpretable models, which in most cases we don't, right? But where we actually understand what happens, I think we have way more confidence that we can accept the model as a rule and don't expect that many mistakes. All right, any questions? Did I forget anything? Any other mitigation strategies you can think of? So in a nutshell, this is a big design space, right? And this has a lot to do with kind of requirements, engineering, figuring out what you can do, what you can't do. It has a lot to do with user interaction design, right? Human computer interactions. Um, I don't think there's any fixed recipe. There are a couple of common mitigation strategies that you can think about. 
right? It's, it's worth thinking about, can I, undo, can I take an automated action and then undo it? Or should I ask somebody? What are the consequences of asking somebody? And I think this just is just exercise in a specific scenario. Whatever system you're building, what can you do? How can you think about this? The other direction that I want to go into now a little bit is risk analysis. So systems may make mistakes and you want to mitigate them, but it's worth to think about what could the consequences of the mistakes could be. Right? And the simplest question you can ask is always, what's the worst that could happen? I'm not sure how likely a robot uprising really is. Um, there are some people like uh, Oxford philosopher uh, Toby Ott uh, who predicts the, so he, he studies uh, existential risk, so risk factors that might wipe out humanity almost entirely, right? So not, not a thing like a normal pandemic that might, or a strong pandemic that might kill a third of the population, really wipe it out entirely, right? So he thinks about things like, an, uh, meteor um, hitting Earth and wiping out all of humanity, right? Or, or an engineered disease that essentially wipes out all of humanity. And in his book, uh, general artificial intelligence is actually rated as the most likely scenario that might end humanity at about 10%. It's a, it's a guess, right? So it's kind of philosophy thinking about this within 100 years. Right? So that's thinking about can we actually get to something like general artificial intelligence that can reason smartly? And then can we put in predictions? If there are multiple countries kind of competing around this, can we limit this? Can we have a kind of a ban on things like this? Um, I'm not sure whether you agree with this. Uh, to me, this sounds too much like science fiction. Um, but this is one way of thinking what's the worst that can happen, right? And humanity. Along those lines, um, who of you has pay, played paper clips before? Who knows this game? So if you don't and you have like four or five hours to waste, uh, this is super fun. It's, you're playing essentially a machine that, tr that, that has a goal of producing paper clips. And it's a kind of a thought experiment. What's the worst that can happen if you instruct a machine to produce paper clips? And I don't want to spoil this anymore. It's a really simple kind of it's a simple web user interface game. Uh, at least to me, this was super addictive. Kind of killed, I think, a Saturday or so, almost entirely uh, producing paper clips. Anyway, and now I guess some of you are uh, distracted for the rest of the lecture. I guess. Um, Here's a URL if you want decision problems. So if you just search for paper clips, you find it. So you can produce paper clips in the background. Um, so it's, but it's not always wiping out all of humanity, right? So if we think about lane assist, what's the worst that could happen? Crash probably crash killing multiple people, right? Accidents. What are other bad things that can happen that are not the worst that can happen, but still pretty bad? Property damage, yeah. Um, damage to the car, pay silently, right? Um, any mildly annoying things that can happen that are still Kind of bad. A flat tire, okay. Sharp, sharp acceleration, um, tickets from the police, traffic rule violations, yeah. Could just start beeping at you the entire time, right? Be really distracting. Um, so there are lots of bad things that can happen in some sense, and some are worse than others, right? So it's not always the worst case. And we can go through this. What are bad things that can happen here, right? Uh, what are the consequences? How bad? What's the worst thing that can happen? Um, so we can go through all those examples again and think about, is this loss of life? Is this loss of money? Is this loss of reputation, right? Um, what can really, what can happen here? 
So this is really risk analysis. So thinking about what can possibly go wrong in my system and what are the possible consequences. And risk typically has two components. It's the likelihood of something occurring and the impact of when it occurs. Right? So wiping out all of humanity is really bad and 10% is pretty likely. So that's a pretty high risk in that regard. Right? Um, causing a slight inconvenience by beeping once in a while, and this might happen from time to time, is maybe not that risky. Right? Crashing the car with a person inside is pretty bad. The impact's pretty high. Now it depends how high the risk is depending on how, how big the analysis is. So for risk analysis, we have a lot of methods that come typically out of the safety community of thinking about what are the possible risks and how can we think about kind of figuring out how bad they are and so on. And I suspect some of you have way more exposure to some of these than others. Um, so some of, the, some of these came up in previous classes in the MSE, Mass and Software Engineering program, I'm sure. Um, but I just want to go through some of them to give you a sense of what the toolbox could look like. Um, and these are useful tools to just think about what can happen. So we know these AI components are, are not perfect, right? They make, can make mistakes, but think about what are the consequences, what are possible risks. Um, so one strategy um, that's fairly commonly used is fault tree analysis. Um, fault trees look something like this, where you have, um, let's activate this again. Um, you have some top event, so that's essentially the bad thing that you don't want to happen. This is a trivial example here of there's no light in the room, right? And then you think about what could cause these things. So you reason backward from the bad thing that can happen to what's causing this. Right? So the car crashes because it exited the lane, what's causing the car to crash? And then there are typically multiple possible causes and some are more likely, some are less likely. Right? So in this case, there are three possible causes directly under it, or the bulbs are burned out, the switch failed, or there's no power. Right? There are again two reasons why, the, why there might be no power. The switch may fail, or because we have two lights in the room, we actually need two conditions that all lights are burned out, right? And you can decompose these things. So you have a top event and you can decompose it into more specific events and you can decompose it further. And I don't really want to go into the notation much. It's fairly straightforward. It's a tree typically with ends and ors, right? Where you have events and then the, the final things are the things that um, are the root causes or potential root causes of problems. Right? It's called a basic event, um, things that you don't decompose further. And what you can do now is think about what are all the combinations that might lead to a problem. Typically you have safeguards in place and things like this. So you may think about even if the prediction is wrong, there should be this other thing that prevents it, right? And only if both of these things fail, we have a problem. Fault trees you can use in multiple different ways. Um, so the, the common analysis is just kind of thinking through, through a problem, right? So starting with, here's a problem, like the car might crash, what can produce it? It's also a debugging tool. Last, last year in this course, we created an assignment that I won't do this year, um, where we gave students a report of the Uber crash, the self-driving car, and then essentially the crash was a bad, a bad case, and then you we kind of designed backwards a tree, um, or students designed in the, in the um, homework a tree of what are all the root causes, right? And in most systems, when something happens and you, you have thought at least a little bit about what could go wrong, typically multiple things need to go wrong for something bad to happen, right? So in the, famously in the Chernobyl case, there are like six things that went wrong to get to this place that Chernobyl exploded. Or in the Equifax attack, if you actually read the report, there are so many mistakes. They had so many safeguards in place that didn't work. Like they had an intrusion detection system that would have detected the Equifax attack had they not forgotten to update their license or their certificate, right? 
and they had multiple of these things, each of which would have prevented this. And so typically, if you look at these actual things, multiple things went wrong, right? And um, a fault tree analysis will help you understand what are the cases that lead to a bad behavior. So the qualitative analysis is figuring out um, what are possible root causes. So the typical analysis here is minimal cut set analysis. I don't care too much about this, but it's kind of what are the smallest sets of basic events, the smallest set of things that can go wrong, right? So in this example here, if, if the switch fails or the network power fails or the fuses burn, all of these will immediately lead to the problem, right? So there are three minimal cut sets. These are three things that are small. You don't need to break them down into smaller things. They alone cause the issue. Whereas here, this cut set is larger. You need two possible things to cause the issue. Right, so you can do a fairly simple analysis. Um, this can be done also with some tools. There are tools for doing this that will tell you what combinations of issues, what small sets of combinations uh, will cause a problem. And then you can also do a quantitative analysis uh, where you assign probabilities to each problem. So you might say the lamp is burned out is maybe 10%, the other one also 10%, that the switch fails is very unlikely. Um, the fuse burn network outage is maybe, I don't know, 5%, fuse burned is 1%, right? And now you can compute overall probabilities um, to just see what's the, what's the chance that the event will actually occur, right? So if we're thinking back to risk, that that's this, the, the product of, of the impact and the likelihood, this is one way to kind of break down an event and think about how likely is it, right? Because you're thinking about how likely are, um, are the events, like how likely is the component to fail, how likely is the component to fail when also the safeguard fails at the same time. Make sense? Who has used four trees before in some homework assignment or something? Okay, not that many, it seems. All right, I would have expected more. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a fairly common safety analysis. Um, and let's, let's maybe just do an example. Um, we should have time for this. So if we're doing AI, um, you want to anticipate mistakes and uh, kind of consequences of kind of mistakes, right? So AI components might fail and you want to evaluate um, what are safeguards. So let's think together maybe about the smart toaster burning. Um, maybe just take a minute and do you have some paper or some notes um, for yourself? Just take a minute or two to think about how could a fall tree look like for my smart toasters burning? And to do this, we to make it more interesting, you actually need some, a little bit of complexity here, right? So you need to think about, we probably have a safeguard like a thermal fuse we have some sensor inputs, probably a uh, bunch of different sensors. Um, so I show you the notation here again, um, or example. Maybe just think about it for for a second.
So what needs to happen for my smart toaster to be burning? How would you decompose this? Somebody minds to speak out? This might be easier than typing. Uh, a failed heating safeguard. So the the, the thermal fuse fails. I can't write that well here, but yeah. That alone wouldn't cause the issue though, right? That's one component of the things that needs to fail. You need some, um, the toaster needs to be turned on, I guess. Heating or something. Right. Um, it needs to be heating too long, right? So what can cause this? Heating so, too much bread in, in a row. <laughs> um, so the temperature sensor fails is another thing, right? So temperature sensor fails is another thing. But we have a smart toaster. So the, the first thing that we're probably starting with is that we have some sort of prediction that went wrong, right? So we have a component that tells us, so the model, okay, I haven't repeated this today, but the model that I've been thinking about the smart toaster is as a function of um, some inputs like the camera input, the heat input and something else to predict, should we continue heating or not, right? So it looks at the bread and until it has a certain browning degree and then it stops toasting, right? And or predicts based on what it recognizes what you put in as a bagel or as a spread or something, how long it should take, right? So the, the first thing is, uh, uh, maybe I shouldn't do this, wrong prediction, right? So if we have a wrong prediction or way too high prediction or so, this is, this is the kind of thing that we're starting with, right? So we assume uh, the model is wrong that alone might burn down the toaster if we don't do anything, right? Assuming that we also have a thermal fuse, both of these things must happen, right? Which is way less likely. So let's say that we have a wrong prediction, we can have a fairly high chance of that happening. We assume, yeah, it could happen for random reasons, but we assume maybe the term of use is 99.99% accurate, right? It will protect us in most overheating cases. So the combined chance of the AI being wrong and the fuse failing is pretty low, right? And then we can also think additionally, what might cause this, if we have other safeguards, um, like we have an overheating, software overheating production, right? Overheating thing that must also fail. And that overheating thing might fail because our terminal sensor is failing, right? So you can break this down further, right? And the overheating system might also fail if there's a bug in the software, I don't know, right? So there's an OR here possibly. We can also try to decompose why we have wrong predictions, but it's often a little bit futile because even if there's no cause of the wrong prediction, we might just have a wrong prediction, um, right? So you can think about is the input to the uh, AI wrong? Um, so I think if you're thinking, reasoning about the risk with some safeguards, it's probably a good idea to just assume you're focusing mostly on the safeguards. You're just assuming the AI, AI might be wrong with a certain chance. Does this make sense so far? So this is a useful tool just to think through how can we get to a bad outcome? And especially think through, we have safeguards, what, what needs to happen that those safeguards can fail, right? If you don't have any safeguards, it's really just wrong prediction, my kitchen burns down, right? You can directly see this is a pretty bad connection, right? This is a pretty bad fault tree because a bad thing can happen directly depending on an AI component, which is something that you probably want to avoid. 
you can probably also involve humans in these trees where you can also say human doesn't stop things. Right? Um, human doesn't pay attention, things like this. Jake? Just going back quickly to when you were talking about computing the probabilities. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess we, by default, you would reason about them like a, a joint probability. But do folks also reason about them sometimes in terms of conditional probabilities? Like if some condition is true, even though the, the uh, joint probability is pretty unlikely, this one condition could cause it overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly likely to fail or something like that? Uh, probably, I, I don't know. Um, I, I haven't looked into this too much, right? So I think there's, you do probably some, some basic propagation of probabilities. I assume you can also compute with how certain are you about your probabilities and just kind of propagate errors. And I assume you can probably also do things that if this happens or this combination happens, something is more likely. Um, I don't, I also don't, I mean, all these probabilities are usually estimated, right? So there's a question of how accurate you really are. So it's usually kind of rule of thumb. Right. Um, in the in the um, in the book about existential uh, threats, they were always kind of thinking about one in a million or ten in a million, right? So kind of those kind of probabilities just ballpark uh, because you're estimating things. Some you can measure. So for term of use, you can probably get data about reliability for hardware components. For reasoning about how to compose them, I'm not entirely sure. All right, so maybe one thing to observe is that fault tree analysis is a backward analysis. You start with the thing that happens, the bad thing that happens, and there's a question of how do you figure out what are the bad things that you care about, right? Or what, what could happen? Can I anticipate all the possible problems? And there are a couple of different safety analyses that go the other way around. Uh, another one is failure mode and effects analysis. Has somebody seen this before? I would expect that this was covered in methods for the MSE students. Um, in analysis, I would, did we talk about this in analysis? I should know that, uh, crap. Um, all right, so this is a forward analysis where you essentially um, systematically, it's an, it's an inspection technique um, where you think about each component and what's the consequence if the component has a mistake, right? So um, this is a radiation example where it says um, the system should provide uh, the required levels of radiation, but it could provide more or less, right? And then you can think about what's the consequence of, that could happen here. And how can you avoid those consequences? You can start really thinking about um, bottom up, what are all the things that, um, that contribute to the thing being safe? And then what would happen if any of those things fail, right? So you don't need to start with the outcome. You start with a problem and think systematically about possible outcomes. So um, typically what you do is you start by identifying system components. And again, you focus kind of about mitigation strategies, maybe humans in the loop and so on, kind of at a fairly high level. And then you enumerate potential failure modes. And my suspicion is that for a machine learning component, this is pretty simple. You just assume machine learning component may have a wrong prediction, right? If it's classification, it might just be wrong. If it's uh, regression, it might be too high, too low, far off, uh, close, so on, right? And then for each failure mode, you think about what's the potential effect on the system um, and how could I mitigate this? And let's do another example here. So um, I don't have time to go through this in detail, but um, this is a potential kind of abstraction of a system for lane detection, right? So you have a bunch of sensors, like what's the steering status? You have a camera, you have maybe a gyro sensor. Based on the camera, you have one AI component um, that does um, predict where the lanes are, right? And you have a different AI component uh, uh, that predicts how, how much you should steer. And then you have some sort of safety system that maybe uh, 
avoids that you're not steering widely left and right or at a high speed you're not turning massively or something like this right and the output is either beeping or actually actuating influencing the steering so now we can go through this each of these components might fail right so it might fail in a different way so the camera might just fail entirely so you have no camera input and you can think about what's the consequence now how can i mitigate this right so you probably want to detect that lane detection just th says no camera input and the system should beep and de disengage and uh, ask the human to take over right or um the camera the different failure mode might be that the camera image the camera is producing an image but it's garbage Right? Maybe because it's rainy or something like this, you have bad visibility, it's low quality, it's grainy, there's dirt on the camera, whatever these things is. And then you can think again through what could happen. Right? Um, if that's a uh, mistake, can the lane prediction thing recognize this? Would this be propagated? Um, right? And this way you might detect things that you haven't really thought about. Maybe you only thought about the crash is the worst thing that can happen. But maybe another bad thing is that during driving, the system just suddenly disengages because the camera is dead or something like this. Right? So you might detect new kind of problems, new kind of hazards that you want to reason about. And once you have those, you can go back and do fault tree analysis and go backward and see how did you mitigate them and so on. Does it make sense? I don't care about the specific technique. If you go out and do something, these might be resources to look at. I think basically these are guided inspections and some modeling tasks, right? So you kind of want to think about um, what are possible things that can go wrong, right? Um, so in this case, you might actually want to think about more than just the prediction is wrong. It may actually make sense to understand a little bit why predictions might be wrong. Right, bad inputs, bad training data, and so on, so that you can actually be a little bit more fine-grained and think about how you can mitigate some of these. Um, I'm gonna skip this. Um, so whereas fault tree analysis is a backward analysis, FMEA is a forward analysis, right? So from the component to the hazards, not from the hazards to the components. There are a couple of more techniques um, they often seem fairly straightforward, but there are um, things that help you to identify hazards in specific ways. So this is one, um, I'm not going to go into detail, but hazard and interoperability study um, has a bunch of guide words that essentially ask you to think about every component. Could one of these things happen, right? So the camera, for example, can it have more or fewer images, I don't know, um, as well as something else. So it's just a structured way of brainstorming, essentially, right? Or kind of, is there? A, can I combine these words with cameras to camera images to come up with potential failure scenarios, right? Potential problems. Um, all right. Any questions about this? So this is just high level thinking about risk, right? Being explicit during requirements engineering. What are bad things that can happen? Where can the AI components cause these bad things? And what kind of mitigation strategies do we have in place? How reliable they are is a good way to think about this. And one more thing that's uh, I'm just going to race through this, that's super obvious for people who have spent significant time on requirements engineering. Um, and that's thinking about the world versus the machine. So in requirements engineering, there's this typical abstraction and it's very useful to think about that there are certain things that the software can know and that the software can't know, right? So the software typically tries to reason about the, about the world. It tries to interact with the world. In the lane assist system, it tries to understand where it is in the world and tries to interact with it. But the internal representation that the software has of the world is typically just an abstraction, right? It's mitigated through sensor inputs. It doesn't really know anything about the world. It just knows what it can see, see through the sensors and it can just interact with the world through actuators. So it's really important to distinguish this, to be careful about this, that there are um, things, there's state in the world, right? What the car is actually doing, 
and there's data in the software what the car thinks it's happening or what the software is doing. And there are only few places where those intersect and those are typically sensors and actuators, right? So where we have some shared phenomenon um, in the real world, somebody wants to do something, right? We start a motor. In the machine world, we have some internal state, some error codes, some implementation things. And then we have the shared phenomenon, which are usually things where the software can learn something about the world, right? And it's useful to think about this. We have requirements. Those are about what we want to happen in the world. We want the car to stay in its lane, right? Requirements are specifically about what we want to happen. And then we have certain assumptions about the environment. For example, if we take a picture from the car is front faced and it represents the world, right? So it's the line markings that we see in the picture are actually there or something like this. So these are assumptions about what the machine can learn about the world, about shared phenomena. And then the specifications are what actually happens inside the machine, right? So given a picture of the front, we should recognize the lane markings, right? The specification doesn't know anything about the world. The specification only knows about the shared, shared phenomenon. It knows about the picture that we have taken of the world, right? Which might or might not be right. And it's useful to think about these as separate things to break down requirements into these three things, requirements, assumptions, and specifications, right? We want something in the world. We can reason about something in the machine and we assume something about how the world behaves with regard to the things that we can observe. So if you think about the self, uh, the smart toaster again, the software that makes the predictions doesn't actually know the temperature of the toaster. It knows what the sensor tells it about the temperature of the toaster. And we assume that the, the temperature sensor is faithful. Right? But if we're thinking about kind of potential problems, it's worse to think about, can we break our assumptions? Are there any cases where the temperature sensor might not be faithful, right? Um, where we might do weird things. Um, so we don't typically have specifications even for the machine learning model, but we still can think about what, what, what's happening, what the machine can reason about, what machine learning can reason about. It's just a representation of the world. Where this becomes really interesting and I'm going to skip a little bit ahead is thinking about feedback loops and adversaries. Right? Because machine learning is in the software world, it only reasons about things what we can perceive about the world. And if an adversary can manipulate the images that we have from the camera, we might not perceive the world as it actually is. Also, by actuating something, we change the world and we want to perceive it again, but we might not fully perceive what's happening. So the feedback loop example, um, that I forgot somebody mentioned earlier about YouTube recommending more and more videos of a certain kind, right? We are interacting with the world, we're affecting something in the world, and that comes back in some way uh, to our senses, right? We have certain assumptions about how the world behaves, but if our assumption about how users prefer to watch the same thing all over again is wrong, we might actually run into some feedback loops, we might um, make predictions that don't behavior. And data drift also makes sense through this lens where the world changes, but our assumptions are potentially outdated. Does this view make sense? I probably should spend more time on this. I probably should come back at least in a, maybe in a recitation, um, maybe in the next lecture um, to go through an example again. Um, it's another way of thinking through what could happen, right? So how can the machine be wrong? How can our, how can our machine learned model be wrong? How can it interact with the world, right? What can it actually perceive of the world? Um, it's, not, it's not taking the world directly as an input, right? It's taking sensors as an input and it's interacting with actuators and all of those are imperfect. Um, so, 
the software and the AI cannot establish the system requirements. They are part of the system. Um, and the environmental assumptions are just as important. And if we misunderstand them, if we model the environment incorrectly, if we misunderstand how humans react to uh, recommendations, we might lead into weird feedback loops and weird results. All right, good time to stop here. Um, what I wanted to do today is to sensitize you about the problem that machine learning may just make mistakes. And I think there's nothing right now that we can ever, that we can do about this. Maybe we at some point really understand how deep neural networks work and can understand this and understand specifications. But right now there's so many th th things that can go wrong, poor data, reverse causation, and all these things that it's safe to assume we have a machine learned model, assume it will make mistakes and it will be very confident about these mistakes sometimes. So you really need to start thinking about planning for mistakes. And there are many different strategies, safeguards and involving humans are some of them. And you really, to understand what, how to do this, it's useful to think about risk, about hazards, um, about how, what can you perceive of the world? How do you interact with the world? Um, and carefully think through this. All right, I think that's a good point to stop. Um, let me know, stick around if you have questions.